Hello and welcome once again to Shepherd of the Valley's weekly video service. I'm Pastor Dave Deckard and we have transitioned into a brand new season of the year. You may notice my stole is purple, the altar pyramids are too. This is the season of Lent. The 40 days that precede Easter and Holy Week, where we walk with Jesus as he begins to understand and translate for us the brokenness of the world around us. And we will walk this Sunday from his temptation in the wilderness all the way to Good Friday and his death on the cross, and then to the glorious resurrection of Easter morning. And we hope that you are with us during this time together. Now, Lent is about confession. It's about telling the truth about how the world is broken, but not for the sake of judgment or calling each other sinners or saying some are better than others. Rather, it is for the sake of us being able to exhale and stop pretending that any of us are perfect or really even that good. And to understand the glorious, beautiful love that God has even for us broken people, even for this broken world. That God sticks with us through this journey is our great hope and our great celebration during this season. Let us begin our Lenten walk together by praying together the prayer of the day. Lord God, our strength. The struggle between good and evil rages within and around us. And the devil and all the forces that defy you tempt us with empty promises. Keep us steadfast in your word. And when we fall, raise us again and restore us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord comes among us this day through the words of the Gospel of Matthew, the fourth chapter. Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. The Gospel of our Lord. As we begin Lent, we hear the traditional story of Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. And you know what? This is often taught in a certain way that's very interesting to me, but maybe isn't quite the right angle, at least not the one I would take. And that is that this scripture points out temptation so that we can see temptation in our own lives and avoid it like Jesus did. Now, that's a lofty goal and aspiration, and to tell you the truth, anytime you or I see an opportunity to avoid temptation and do something better, we should do that, absolutely. I would not argue against that. I think your life will be better if you take that way. But let me ask you this. Has anyone ever succeeded at this? Ever? Even the most lofty and holy people among us, or seemingly holy, if you look in the news, if you look around, how many of them have been secretly stumbling along doing other things for years? And that's just in the obvious ways that make the news. 
If you were to examine my life, you would probably find a thousand little things that I don't do right. And if you're not sure about that, just ask my teenage children. They will tell you all the things that their dad does wrong as a father, probably as a person, and a hundred other ways. But you know what? I could do the same thing about them. We could all do the same thing about you, you about your neighbors, and so on and so on. Because if you examined our lives, not a one of us is perfect. And any claim to be perfect or really even holier than thou is doomed to founder on the rocks of reality as that well-intended and somewhat pompous ship sinks into the sea of temptation in which we all wallow. As a matter of fact, here's how sneaky temptation really is. Half the time we succumb to it, we just say we're doing something good or right. I'm gonna educate that person on the way that they should think because this is the right moral or ethic. And maybe it is the right moral or ethic, but is it right for all people at all times without fail? Eh. And by the way, how are you employing it? Are you employing it with love and grace and humility? Or are you walking into a room saying, I know exactly what's right, you do not. Sit down and listen to me. Shouldn't that cause at least a little bit of pause that you are somehow exalting yourself as more perfect or more right or more knowledgeable than the people around you? And in the crusade to be correct or right, we speed that ship directly towards the rocks and ram it on them again and again until everyone around us looks and just shakes their heads because everybody can see what we're doing it what we're doing even when we are blind to it don't even have to go that far i've told this story before but if you haven't been with us for a couple years it bears repeating <laughs> every time i go into a buffet do you think i make the right choices is there even a right choice? First of all, I am there going, I want that greasy chicken and I want the starchy potatoes and I want all the carbs I can get, right? This is not good for me, but my body, my mind, my taste buds tell me that that's the right decision. Those are the rightest things to do. And even if a higher part of my consciousness says, you know what, all that salt and all that fat and all that sugar probably isn't that great for you, what happens if I just sit there gnawing on a stalk of broccoli? It doesn't really change the story in the end. It might make things better on the way, but ultimately I will gnaw on broccoli until I die anyway. I'll just be less happy doing it. So which way did I pick that was perfectly right? Here's the reality. It didn't exist. And it doesn't exist for any of us, no matter how holy or right we try to be. And this shows us the flaw in looking at this gospel and saying, well, Jesus avoided temptation, so you do it too. Here's the thing. Here's the part that's missing in that equation. You're not God. Neither am I. And unless there were a God, that's where the story would end. Because each one of us, in our own version of the wilderness, would look at temptation and either not recognize it as such or fall prey to it and go merrily off the edge of the cliff into irrelevancy, into impermanence, into death. And there we go. That's it. That's exactly what the story would have been like were it not for this moment with Jesus. Because here's the real heart of this story. We can't do what Jesus did here, but him doing it changed everything. We know we can't do it because right at the beginning, how long did he fast? 40 days and 40 nights. Ever try that one? People have fasted for ages. You know what? You're lucky if you can make it a couple days. If you make it a week, you're going to be absolutely famished. If you make it for 40 days and 40 nights, you will not make it, okay? You would not survive. Jesus does. That's not so much, you know, a sign of his power, whatever, you can say all that stuff. But it's a big flashing neon sign to us right at the beginning. This is not you. 
This is not me. This is not something we're capable of. This is different. It's like a red flags going, pay attention to this. This is different than anything you've ever seen. And that continues throughout because the devil shows up and says to Jesus, hey, turn these bread or turn these rocks into bread or jump off of this building so that God can save you and you can prove God exists. Or, hey, look at the whole world. I will give all of it to you if you just kneel to me. The first one, we might be able to resist a little bit. You know, uh, well, I can eat later. The second one, well, who wants to jump off a building? And by the way, if we have enough faith, we could probably say God exists without us having to prove it. But the third one, at least, I mean, ain't nobody getting through that one. And by the way, we probably wouldn't get through the first two either. But the third one, I mean, come on. Right now, right now, you're listening to me, right? Right now, a guy comes outside your window and dangles a lottery ticket for whatever one of them billion dollar lotteries. Are you sitting here still listening to the word of God or are you going to go outside to that guy? It's over for all of us. Even I would, if that guy were standing outside that door right now, I would say, love you, you're not God. God loves you though, amen, bye. I'm going to go get my lottery ticket. All of us fall prey to temptation. Even if we know better, Even if we know that's ultimately not going to make our life that much better or we're going to die anyway or whatever, we can't help it. And that's why at the end of our lives, we end. Not because of some great cosmic judgment or any hate of us or even hate of sin or anything like that. But simply because that which is imperfect and broken and painful for the self and the world cannot last forever, lest that pain and brokenness last forever. My brokenness can't last forever. Yours can't either. Neither can the world. Can you imagine these things? As we said before, racism forever and intolerance forever, let alone, you know, bone marrow cancer forever or migraine headaches forever or whatever it is. When you take the brokenness of the world and stretch it into infinity, it's cruelty, which is why nothing broken can last. And it doesn't. And again, Were it not for Jesus, that would be the end of the story. Nothing lasts forever. Life is temporary. There's no real meaning. Hey, blah. But Jesus stands in the midst of this wilderness and says, where everyone and everything else fails, I will stand. Not because I need to. I could teleport out of here up to heaven or somewhere else. or I don't have to deal with this for my own sake. I'm fine but I will stand here for the sake of you all, the people who couldn't make it, because I will not abandon them. I will go hungry so that they are not hungry. I will trust in God so that they can trust in God. I will refuse to take dominion over a broken world and enshrine it to me so that they will know that there is something more powerful, real, and true than simply scrambling over each other to be the one who does that. Jesus says, I will go through this because they go through this, and I will not abandon them. And even though it might cost me my life, and it did, I will not let them go. That is why we needed a God. And that is why our Savior stood there and resisted this temptation, endured this temptation, refused to succumb to this temptation, whatever it is you want to say. Whatever he did, he did. We can't. But he did it for the sake of all of us. So that we know when we're hungry, we're tired, we made a mistake, we broke the world too, or we're broken by the world. When we are abused or neglected, when we do not have enough, yes, even when our bodies and minds and hearts fail, and even when we pass from this world, we are not abandoned, we are beloved. And the one who stood there on this day in place of us and for the sake of us did not fall but instead endured and lived for our sake. And that 
is how solid that union is between us in a way that cannot be broken by any temptation or brokenness of the world. That is how much we are loved in the midst of all of the faults and failings we see around us and within us. Rejoice today, for you are not God and neither am I. And no matter how much we'd like to pretend, we will never be. But rejoice also that there is a God who loves us eternally without fail and who will never let us go. And as we walk this journey before, before us, know that we do not walk it alone, but that love and grace that was shown in the wilderness that day, that endurance and solid holding on to of hands and lives and the world remains to this day so that we may rejoice in the midst of temptation and brokenness, saying not that we are perfect, but instead that we are beloved and rescued and saved. Amen. God's word. Let us pray together. Lord, we want to be like you. We've wanted this since the very beginning of things, when we grasped for the fruit on the tree, when we built the Tower of Babel to try to reach to heaven, when we tried to get things right in the wilderness and ended up with a golden calf, when we built temples in the midst of the city and said you dwelt there and this would be the center of all things forever. And yet, no matter how hard we try, no matter what we try to follow, we find that we simply fall short. We cannot be you. We are not perfect. We make mistakes. We hurt each other. We take power and control when we should be showing mercy. We grasp for ourselves when we should be sacrificing and giving up. But we know that we don't have to be you that you are you and you are our God and that is sufficient for all of us and that your infinite love and mercy touch all of the world that fill up all of its gaps that everywhere we fall short of what we should be there you are wrapping your arms around us and saying that you are still here we claim that promise for ourselves for all those in need for those who hunger, for those who are without homes, for those who do not have clean water, 
for those whose lands are torn by warfare or strife, for those who are ill or facing transitions, including the end of life, for those who are mourning the loss of loved ones that they cannot bring back, for those who are abused or neglected, experiencing domestic violence or divorce, or tearing apart of families. We pray for all those in any need, that they would feel your arms around them as well, and your reassurance that you will never leave us. Help us as we face temptations to be guided by things beside you, to exhale and to trust in you, and to understand that your love will never let us go, so that we in turn can hold on to each other and share that love and hope with the world. Amen. We invite you now to gather bread and wine or whatever you have on hand, so we can celebrate together the sacrament of Holy Communion, which renews and fills us all by uniting us with God and God's Spirit. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us pray together the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We invite you now to take the bread and the cup, or whatever you have, and to share them with the people next to you, saying, this is the body of Christ given for you, and this is the blood of Christ shed for you. And if you are watching this by yourself, you may partake of the elements as I offer them to you, knowing that God is filling you every bit as much as God fills all of God's children across the world. This is the body of Christ given for you. And this is the blood of Christ shed for you. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace, now and forevermore. Amen. We hope that your journey through these 40 days and, heck, just through this week will be blessed by God's mercy and grace shared with you. And may you also be able to share that mercy and grace with the people around you at home, at work, at school, wherever you are. God's spirit flows through you. And no matter how broken the world is, it will never swallow up or diminish God's love for you or the world one single bit. May your life be full of that love, and may God's joy show through you now and always. Amen.